Welcome to church. Um, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Joe and I'm one of the pastors here. And today we are wrapping up the series that we've been in for the past few weeks called Awakening. Let me hear y'all say Awakening. And we've talked a lot about awakening over the past four weeks. Uh, week one, we talked about how we all need awakening. And then we talked about the great God of awakening. And then we talked about how we need to uh, not fall asleep on faith and not get caught up in just cultural, conventional uh, religion. And that we need to wake up to the kingdom of God. And last week, we talked about the power and the promise and the presence of God. And today we're going to be talking about God's vehicle for awakening, which is the local church. I need you to turn to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor. Say neighbor. Say, are you awake? All right. Now I want you to turn to your other neighbor, your second option. Okay. The person that you clearly like a little bit less. And I want you to say neighbor, stop sleepwalking on faith. See, sometimes we need other people in our lives to tell us to stop sleepwalking and to wake up. Because if we're honest, it can be easy to find ourselves caught up in this cultural current and of faith. And we find ourselves lulled to sleep and just sleepwalking through life. It can be easy to find ourselves caught up in the streams of everyday striving for success. We can get caught in busyness and distraction, and we can let all of these things rule our lives, and then we can find ourselves spiritually lethargic, falling asleep on faith. But the beauty of what God has done for us is that God has created the church to be the very place where the people of God gather together to wake each other up from our spiritual slumber and to step into the purposes that God has for our lives. And so today, if you're taking notes, is all about awakening to the gathering. Awakening to the gathering, why you need to stop sleeping on church. Let me just say, I love the church. God has used the local church to change my life forever, and so I have given my life to try and build Jesus' church. And in spite of all the church's flaws and imperfections and scars and stains, I truly believe that the local church is the best thing happening in the world right now. I truly believe that the local church is better than anything you can give your time, your money, your schedule to. It's better than spin class. It's better than CrossFit. It's better than fantasy football. It's better than college game day. It's better than that concert. It's better than that Netflix show. It's better than the best dinner that Atlanta can offer. And I love food. It is better than the NFL. It's better than the NBA. And it surely is better than baseball. Baseball is boring, y'all. Sorry, Jake. It's better than Sunday golf. And it's better than Sunday siestas. My whole hope today is to help you and me recapture and recast a vision for why gathering together as the local church really, truly matters. See, Jesus created the church, Jesus commissioned the church, and Jesus called the church to change the world. And the church, when we talk about the church, it's the people of God gathered together to wake up to the purposes and plans of God. Like we don't just gather here on Sunday nights because this is just what you do in the South. We're in the Bible Belt. We don't gather here on Sunday nights because this is just what your grandma told you to do. Go to church. We don't gather here for cultural reasons. We gather because as you look through scripture and you look through church history, we can see hundreds if not thousands of reasons of why we should gather together as the church of Jesus. And so tonight, I wanna give us seven reasons of why we should gather together and why we all need to stop sleeping on the church, all right? Now a little disclaimer, okay? I get that some of y'all in the room, you're like, Joe, I brought a friend here tonight and this is like kind of one of those messages where it's like, you might as well preach a message on money tonight. Like we're already here and you're gonna tell us of why we need to be at church when we're here on Labor Day weekend. Like Joe, we see the value of this and, and I get that, okay? I get that. Uh, you may be wondering, like, Joe, couldn't you have just preached on the love of God tonight? And I promise we're going to get there. That's actually point number one. But so much of why we're talking about this tonight is this is a discipleship conversation. 
This is so much about sowing seeds into our faith and building deep roots where at some point in our lives when a storm comes or at some point in our lives where we find ourselves busy and at some point in our lives where things start to change and rhythms start to change and we start to forsake the gathering of the church, my hope and my prayer is that we would remember tonight and we remember the words spoken tonight and that we would catch a vision for the church that is deep rooted into our heart and in our lives where we say, hey, this is the best place that I can be on a Sunday night or a Sunday morning, that there is no place that I would rather be than with the people of God in the house of God. And so point number one of why we need to awaken to the gathering and why we need to stop sleeping on the church is because Jesus opened the door and invites us to come in and meet with God. So you can know that you're sleeping on church when you forget what it cost Jesus so that you could be a part of God's family. As we just read in our teaching text, Hebrews 10, the writer says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Now, let me pause for a second, okay? That word, therefore, I want you to underline that word. Um, My father-in-law, he's a Baptist preacher, and he says, anytime you see that word, therefore, you got to ask yourself, what is that there for? Therefore, anyone that grew up in church, you, you, you've heard that before. And so if you flip back through the beginning of Hebrews chapter 10, the writer is just trying to remind us all of what Jesus has done for us to be the ultimate sacrifice to make a way for you and for me to know God. And so he's like, because of what Jesus has done, we have confidence to enter into the holy places. We'll get to that in a second. By the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Underline those words, draw near. With a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Did you know that we haven't always been able to gather like this? Did you know that before Jesus came to earth, God's presence was distant from his people? In first century Palestine, the holy temple in Jerusalem was the center of all of Jewish religious life and culture. And the temple, we've got a picture right here, is where the Jewish people would gather and they would uh, offer animal sacrifices and they would carry out worship according to the Mosaic law. And they were faithful to that worship. And before the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, before Pentecost, like we talked about last week, uh, God's presence dwelled in the temple. And it was here in the temple where God's presence could be found in the Holy of Holies. And it was here in the Holy of Holies, the specific part of the temple, where once a year, one person, the great high priest, could enter into that space and meet with God and offer sacrifices on what's known as the Day of Atonement. And what separated the Holy of Holies where God dwelt from the rest of the temple where man could gather was a dividing curtain known as the veil. And the veil, it was 60 feet tall and it was 30 feet wide and it was four inches thick. And it was so big, so massive, so heavy that it was said that it would take over 300 priests just to move the veil if they had to. This is what was separating mankind from the holiness, the greatness of God. And this signified to the rest of the world that man was separated forever from God by sin. But God. But because of God's love, the Father sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice to forgive you and me of our sin so that we can be made right with God. And when Jesus died, both the spiritual and the physical veil were torn down. In Matthew 27, we see as Jesus took his last breath on the cross, it says, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. See, the wall that kept us out came down when Jesus gave himself up. This barrier was torn from top to bottom to show, to prove that only God could make a way for us to enter into his presence. Like none of these high priests were gonna climb on top of that veil, climb up 60 feet and start to tear it from the top. It would have been impossible, but God says, no, I'm gonna remove that veil. I'm gonna tear the veil so that you can enter into my presence. And this is actually the theme of the entire book of Hebrews, that Jesus is our great high priest, the better priest. He made, he established a new covenant, a better covenant, a better way for us to relate and draw near to God. And it's through him. 
See, Jesus died so that the people of God could go into the presence of God with other people. See, God wasn't content with just a one-man worship show once a year. No, he tore the veil so that you and I could come into the presence of God regularly. See, the church is a physical picture of the greatest demonstration of love that has ever been made. That Jesus literally and physically opened the door and he's inviting you and me to come in and meet with God. And so why does this matter? Why do we gather? Because Jesus bled and died for the church. And his blood declares that this matters. He died to open the door to invite you and me to come in and meet with God. But point number two of why we need to awaken to the gathering and stop sleeping on church is because gathering is both a privilege and a command. We get to and we have to. See, listen, you can know that you're sleeping on church if you say things like, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You ever said that before? Maybe heard someone say that before? I don't, you know, I don't got to go to church to be a Christian. I can just, you know, worship on my, by myself. Like, you know, I got my own thing going on. Like, that's okay. The problem with that is that the Bible has something different to say. Hebrews 10, 25, like we just read, says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Listen, the writer of Hebrews is like, hey, I know some of y'all think that you're above this whole gathering thing. I know some of y'all think you got something more important planned. I know some of y'all think, you know, I got lunch, brunch with Bay planned on the calendar. Like, I can't miss that. Or in Elevate City's case, like, we meet at, <laughs> at night. So you got a date with your TV. You got a date with the couch. You're going to that brewery. Some of y'all are like, I'm just trying to, like, get ready for the week, make lunches for my kids for school. Like, there's so many things that we've got going on. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, do not forget. Do not forget. Do not neglect the gathering of the people of God. See, gathering isn't optional for true followers and disciples of Jesus. Let's look back. See, for thousands of years leading up to Jesus' resurrection, the ancient Jewish people would gather together in homes and in the synagogue, and they would observe Sabbath together. See, for them, gathering together was essential. It wasn't something that was even an option, like you did it, because it was founded in the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai for the people of God. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Y'all, this is the fourth command all time that God gives to his people. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's crazy that that's how important this is. See, Sabbath is both personal and it's communal. It's corporate. It's about worship and it's about rest. And so why do we gather on Sundays? Well, for the Jewish people, Sabbath or Shabbat is what they call it, happens on Saturdays. But for followers of Jesus, uh, it, Following Jesus' resurrection, the early church decided that they were going to move their Sabbath to the Lord's Day, also known as the first day of the week, also known as the day of Jesus' resurrection. They moved it to Sunday to remember that Jesus is alive. And so the writer of Hebrews, he also addresses this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. He says, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. He's like, hey, this didn't end when the new covenant showed up. This didn't end after Jesus came to make a new way for us to relate with God. This is still happening. I've elevated this, in fact, that for the early Christian church, it wouldn't have been just like one day a week that they gathered. They absolutely did that. But it would have been an all throughout the week thing. The church was a part of every day of their lives. And so for almost 2,000 years now, Christians, followers of Jesus, have gathered together on Sundays to be obedient to God. Doesn't have to be Sunday to be Sabbath, though. But when we gather, what we're doing is we're stepping into thousands of years of rich history and of the saints and the fathers of our faith who did not sleep on the gathering of church but gave their lives to see us be able to gather today. And so we don't gather merely because of tradition. We gather because the foundation of our faith is built on Jesus' people gathering. 
The Apostle Paul, he says in Ephesians chapter 2, speaking about the church, he says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He says, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. See, the beauty of the gospel is that through Jesus's, through Jesus, God's presence, his Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, comes to dwell in me. And so now we're the temple. We're the dwelling place of God. And God comes to live in us. And when we gather, we don't gather to worship some distant, some far out, some separated God. No, we worship the one true God who has made himself known to us and reveals himself to us in greater measure as we gather. And so, yes, God's spirit and his presence is not confined to a specific location, but he has called us to come together as many members of one body. John Wesley, he once said, there's nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. And so yes and no, like you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but you cannot be a Christian without being the church and you cannot be the church without coming together as the church. And so a better word for this little phrase is that I get to go to church and I do because I'm a Christian. We get to. It's both a command and a privilege. It's a privilege because did you know that the church in China, they got to meet underground? Did you know that the church in India, like they meet in homes, in hiding? The church in Syria, they fear for their lives every single time that they gather. They risk their lives every single time that they gather together. Why? Because they know it's a command and they know it's worth it. It's what they do. It's a privilege that the church gets to gather together. The third reason of why we need to awaken to the gathering is because the church is more than a building, but it's not less than a gathering. So you can know that someone's sleeping on church when they say things like, the church, the church it ain't a building. I don't need to go there. You know, the church is so much more than a building. It's not a building. You don't need to go to church on Sunday nights. Why do y'all go there and sweat so much? Like, what's the big deal? It's not a building. Well, it's only kind of true. Because yes, the church isn't limited to a building, but it's not the church if it never gathers. Well, let's look at the Bible. In the New Testament, the word that we see used 114 times to describe the church is this word, ecclesia. Let me hear y'all say, ecclesia. And it simply means assembly. Or when speaking about the church, it's the called out assembly. And this word would have actually been used in their day uh, to describe public gatherings in the ancient Roman world. But in scripture, it's primarily used to describe the gathering of the people of God. In Matthew 16, Jesus, he says this to Peter. He says, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, in Matthew, Jesus announces right here that his mission was to build his ecclesia, his gathered people, his called out people that assemble together. He's saying, I'm establishing a new community of followers, a new people that are united together to fight against darkness, to push back darkness, and to advance the kingdom of light. Jesus says later on in Matthew 18, 20, he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Now, some people will try to use this verse right here to say, yeah, I got two people in my house. Like, I don't need to go to church. Like, Jesus says he's right there with us. Okay, well, hold on, bro. Because what Jesus wanted us to focus on right here and there, the emphasis isn't on the amount of people. The emphasis is on the gathering. It's on the gathering. It's that when we gather, Jesus shows up every single time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, he writes this. He says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. <laughs> I was reading that this week and I just like chuckled. I was like, people be saying all the time, church ain't a building. Paul says right here, the church is a building. It's a little confusing, but that's just funny. Hebrews chapter 3, the writer says, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So listen, the key here isn't that 
God's saying his presence is confined to a building. It's that God's people are like a building. God's people are like a house that get built up together, that grow together. See, the church isn't a building, but it's a family. And where do families gather? They gather in buildings. I want you to think for just a second with me about some of your favorite TV shows, some of the most iconic TV shows ever. There's always a place that they gather. Like, think about this, on Friends. Y'all remember Friends? Where did they gather? They gathered at Central Park. And you always saw this near the beginning of the episode, and then it would transition inside, and you would see them hanging out on this couch. Now, would Friends be the show that it was without Central Park? Absolutely not. Like, where would Ross and Rachel have had their first kiss if not for Central Park? Think about the show Seinfeld. Beginning of Seinfeld, what do you see at the beginning of every episode? You see this diner. And then it transitions inside and you see them sitting at this table where every single episode they argue and yell at each other for a very long time. On the show New Girl, they've got apartment 4D, the loft where everything happens on the show. The show would not be the show without the loft where they would gather inside over and over and laugh and play. Parks and Rec. It was pa Pawnee's grungy city hall. You remember on Parks and Rec, every episode starts out like this and then it transitions inside where you see them inside of the parks department. And then the office. The office had this building right here. You're telling me that the office would be the office without this, without this space where they would gather together inside. See, for every great show, for every great story, there's a place that they gather that turns strangers into families. Buildings matter because people matter and people gather in buildings. That's why we at Elevate City, we're so passionate about praying for a permanent place to call home for Elevate City. My son, he still prays for it every single night. Jesus, we pray for a place to call home for Elevate City Church. He don't even really realize what he's talking about, but he prays for it every single night. And it's not because we just want to own a building for fun. No, we want a place to call home because we want to have a place where anyone and everyone can come and start to know Jesus and discover what it looks like to follow Jesus and be trained up on how to lead other people to do the same. We want it to be a beacon of hope in our city and in our community. And I get, you can watch church online. And that's so helpful at times. Tonight, ironically, our online just isn't working, which is crazy and sad and ironic. And I don't know what God's trying to do there. We can watch online, but listen, we cannot forsake the gathering of the people of God and just become a pixelated people who worship a pixelated savior. We need to gather together. Reason number four to awaken to the gathering is because we are better when we are together. Hebrews 10, says, let us draw near. Listen, I need the church and the church needs me. You need the church and the church needs you. We are better for each other and better for this world when we come together. See, listen, even secular organizations and researchers are realizing the importance of the church gathering. Check out some of this research. A Gallup survey in 2021 found that only those who consistently attended religious services each week are happier today than they were before COVID-19 capsized the globe. Did you catch that? Research shows that the only people who made it out of the pandemic happier and better off than they were before are the people who prioritized weekly going to church. It's crazy. Pew Research says that actively religious adults are more likely to be happy and volunteer to good causes. National Library of Medicine says that regular churchgoers live longer and happier lives. Harvard launched a human flourishing program in which they found that religion and spiritual involvement has a stunning correlation to human flourishing. Really? Tell me more. Children who regularly attend religious services and pray frequently are significantly less likely to suffer from depression, less likely to use drugs, more likely to report higher levels of happiness, higher levels of forgiveness, more likely to volunteer in their community, more likely to have a sense of mission and purpose. Everyone's searching for happiness. 
but people don't want to prioritize going for church. Research shows going to church affects your life in a positive way. Harvard researchers concluded that weekly church attendance effectively improved the physical and mental health of millions of Americans and reduced mortality, made them live longer, by 20 to 30% over a 15 year period. It'll make you live longer too. I need the church and the church needs me because we are better when we're together. But listen, I'm not naive. I do know that many people, they've actually experienced hurt and pain from people within the church. Like you may be here and maybe you've experienced that before. But the reality is that we are imperfect people. We are all sin stained, we are all selfish and we are all struggling. And just like a family, when they gather together for dinner, there's bound to be a mess of dishes left in the sink. There's going to be a plate or two that gets dropped. Trash has to get taken out over and over. A drink is going to spill on the couch and someone is going to get mad. But should we stop meeting together as a family? Just because we're messy? Just because we're messy people living in a messy world? And I'm not saying this tonight to illegitimize your pain or your hurt. I know the wounds can be deep and the scars can be real. And so I want to acknowledge this, but I also want to call you to not give up on church as a whole because of the sin of a few. See, our expectation at church can't be that we interact with perfect people in perfect situations. That's not how the church works. I heard this guy say earlier this week, if you find the perfect church, don't go there because you'll ruin it. But in spite of all of that, we are truly better together. You know, gathering together, so much of what we do is preventative. Like, you may not realize it right now, but what's happening right now is forming you, is shaping you, is protecting you, is preparing you for storms that are to come. You know, addiction and affairs oftentimes are born in isolation as you seclude yourself from other people. There's this debate uh, happening online where these different people were writing back and forth and one guy wrote and he was complaining about how it made no sense to go to church on Sundays. He said, I've gone to church for 30 years now. He said, and in that time, I've heard something like 3,000 sermons, but for the life of me, I can't rem remember a single one of them. So I think I'm wasting my time. Someone commented back. He said, I've been married for 30 years now. And in that time, my wife has cooked some 32,000 meals for me. But for the life of me, I can't recall the entire menu of a single one of those meals. But I do know this. They all nourished me and gave me the strength I needed to do my work. If my wife had not given me these meals, I'd be physically dead today. Likewise, if I had not gone to church for nourishment, I would be spiritually dead today. So you may not realize it in the moment. Sometimes you may leave and just be like, ah, I don't know if I'm feeling it. I don't know if this is doing that much for me. But I want you to ask yourself, who would I become without this place? Who would I become without the gathering? What would I turn into? You may not know or realize that you need church right now, but you will. You will. I need the church and the church needs me. Reason number five of why we need to awaken to the gathering and stop sleeping on the church is to do the church things that we're commanded to do. This is kind of one of those like catch all points, okay? So there's like a lot of points within this point, but it's to do the church things that we're called to do. And the greatest picture I believe that we see of what the church can and should look like in the Bible is found in Acts chapter two, beginning in verses 42 through 47. And just catch up on some of the things that they were doing right here says, and they, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together, let me hear you say together, together. and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God 
and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Listen, this is the kind of church that we are striving to be. Elevate City isn't trying to be like the next mega church down the street. Elevate City isn't trying to be more like that next innovative church online. Elevate City is trying to be like this Acts 2 church that we see and read about right here. We're just trying to look more like this. We're just trying to walk more in the ways of Jesus. You see, if they didn't gather then, we wouldn't be here right now. And if they didn't do those things then, we wouldn't be here right now. But thankfully, they gathered. And they gave us a model for what gathering can and should look like. And they implemented rhythms and spiritual practices or sacraments that the church is called to do together. And I just want to read some of them that we see right here in the scripture. See, it's here. It's the place where they gathered to care for one another and to build the church. It's the place where they gave sacrificially no matter the cost. Church was the place where they took the Lord's Supper together regularly. Church was the place where they baptized new believers. When it said the Lord added to their number day by day, it would have been that those people were baptized. They were added into the church. It's the place where they broke fast together with feasts or potlucks. Any of y'all grow up in church where you had a potluck? Y'all ever had a potluck before? So that's actually what would have happened. They would have fasted together and then they would have broken fast together by coming together with lots of food and they would have this big feast or potluck. And they happened in the fellowship hall every single time. It's the place where they celebrated wedding ceremonies. It's the place where they anointed the sick and cared for the poor. It's the place where they sat under Bible teaching and fanned faith in each other's hearts. It's the place where they experienced awe for God and saw miracles happen among them. Now I could keep going on and on and on. I I could list like a hundred plus reasons for why you got to not sleep on the church, but I'm just going to give you a few more right here, okay? The church, it's the place where the people of God gather to awaken praise in one another's hearts. It's the place where we're called to awaken faith in our families, in our kids, and in our marriages. It's the place where we're called to suit up with the armor of God and stand against the enemy. It's the place where we gather to care for one another in all things. It's the place where we gather to serve our community and seek the welfare of our city. It's the place where we gather to give our gifts and abilities to build up the body of Christ. It's the place where we come under spiritual authority and spiritual leadership. It's the place where we make prayer a part of the DNA of our lives. It's the place where we tell each other to wake up from our spiritual slumber. It's the place where we awaken influence to stand out in a culture that wants us to conform. It's the place where we gather to awaken our love and understanding of the word of God. It's the place where we gather to unlock the power of the gathering in corporate worship. It's the place where we gather to exalt God, to edify one another and to evangelize the lost and broken world. It's the place, come on. It's the place where we're also called to one another, one another. You read through scripture and over and over a hundred times and in 59 unique ways, the New Testament commands us to love one another, to encourage one another. We see it in Hebrews 10 right here, stir up one another, encourage one another. This is a theme and a model of the early church and you can't one another if you don't gather. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he says, to love God is to love his church. Reason number six, why we got to awaken to the gathering and stop sleeping on church is because Jesus's church is the hope of the world. Did you know that the world needs the church to gather? Tim Keller, he says this, he says, in the church, we're not called to solve all the problems of the world, but to participate in God's solutions for the world. In other words, how God solves the problems of the world is through his church. That when we come and be a part of a local body, we're participating in God's strategy, his plan, his plan A for how to reach and save the world. There's no plan B. The church is plan A. It is the hope of the world. Just turn on the news, scroll on your phone for a few minutes, and you can see that our world is in need of hope. War in Ukraine and other parts of the world. 
terrorism, diseases, threats of global pandemics, natural disasters, fires, hurricanes, flooding, and food crisis. And then there's what's happening in culture. Truth is irrelevant. It's decided by the individual. The sexual ethic of today is non-existent. There's a war for the souls of your children and your future children and your children's children. There's a war every single day for our soul, for our time. Social media is buying our souls and stealing our attention and it's lulling us to sleep. And in the midst of all of this, all of this brokenness and pain, God has established the church to stand united as a beacon of hope in a lost and dying world. The church is a lighthouse in the midst of an ethical fog. In a world of a multiplicity of viewpoints, there is one place that people can gather to find truth and experience hope, and it's the church. In Hebrews chapter six, verse 19, the writer says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, behind the veil. See, because of what Jesus has done for us to make a way for us to know God, we don't live like the rest of the world. We live anchored in Jesus. We live with hope. In a world where all of hope seems lost, the church gets their hopes up. We're the ones that put hope on the move for the people in this world who have yet to experience the love of Jesus. We are the hope of the world. I want to close with two wild yet remarkable stories. And the first one is found in Acts chapter 20. And earlier when Joey said, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, I was like, he's going to preach my message. What? <laughs> Acts chapter 20, you can go ahead and turn there. It'll be easier for you to find. You were there earlier. And, uh, and as you're turning there, I want to give a little context, and then I'm going to give our point number seven for why we need to awaken to the church. And as you're turning there, a um, little context. The book of Acts is written by Dr. Luke. And Dr. Luke was one of Jesus' disciples, apostles. And, and Dr. Luke, he was very specific and very thorough. And I don't think it's by chance that he left this crazy story right here in Acts chapter 20 that's so short, but yet so miraculous. And he sets the stage by beginning in Acts chapter 20, talking about all these different places that the apostle Paul had gone to put hope on the move, that had got, he had gone to plant local churches and local bodies so that the message of the gospel could spread throughout the world. And so he's listing all these places that the apostle Paul had been, and then he says, and we ended up in Troas. And he says, and we stayed there for seven days. And there's nothing really remarkable about that except for what's about to happen that day on the seventh day that they were there. It says in verse chapter seven, or verse seven in chapter 20, it says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them. Intending to depart on the next day, he prolonged his speech until midnight. Okay, so let me pause for a second. In the midst of this story, I wanna give you four application points, four things that you can do with a message like this, and I promise they're gonna be brief. The first is this. We see here in this scripture that they had a commitment to the weekly gathering, no matter the circumstances. And I wanna challenge you to have a commitment to the weekly gathering, no matter the circumstances. We're about to read in a second more about what this gathering looked like for them, but they gathered on the first day of the week. They gathered on Sunday. And this is actually the most prominent, the most clear picture we see in the New Testament of the local church gathering on Sundays, particularly on Sunday nights. For them, Sunday it was the first day of the week. It was a work day. And so can you imagine having to work all day outside in the hot sun, sweating? A long day, you are tired and worn out, and then you gather for church in the evening, and the church goes on to midnight. Some of y'all, you show up here on Sunday nights and you're like, man, I can barely hang out for two hours, let alone midnight after you have been working all day. And it says in just a second that they were meeting in the upper room. So they were in this small room packed in there like sardines, y'all. It was stinky. It was smelly. But the Holy Spirit was about to show up. And what's remarkable about this story is that the Apostle Paul, he's there and he's about to leave the next day. But before he leaves, he's like, ah, let me preach one more sermon. One more message before I leave. It was like Joey every single Sunday night where he's like, this is the greatest message you're ever going to hear. 
And he believes it, and you better believe it, because it's going to be the greatest message you're ever going to hear. And they didn't even care that it was going till midnight. They did not care. You want to know how? The next verse says, and there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. Y'all, they showed up ready. They showed up expectant. They showed up believing that Paul was gonna preach all night long. They brought their lamps. They went to work that morning. They got home, they grabbed their lamps. They went to church and they said, however long it takes, we are here for it. We are here for it. Point number two is for you to prepare and come ready to receive. Y'all, we've had some crazy circumstances here at Elevate City Church. Did you know one night this church got struck by lightning? Power just went out in here. Maybe you missed that night and you're like, man, I'm bummed I missed that night. It was wild. Most Sunday nights, yes, we don't have AC. It's a little bit cooler today because we got these big old loud machines in here. But most nights you show up and you're gonna sweat and you might not even know if we got water in this place. Y'all were here for that day where we had to take jugs of water with us to the bathroom. It was like, welcome to church. Here's your jug of water. Head on into the bathroom. Ran out of water. We've had some crazy circumstances and it could be easy to just show up to church and be like, it's just gonna be another Sunday. No, when you've had crazy circumstances, you show up to Elevate City, you better come ready and prepared because God is gonna move. We saw crazy things happen this past fall where we gathered to worship on a Sunday night and the spirit just started to move and we stayed here praying until 10.30 at night. And the next night we decided to gather and we stayed here praying until, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night. And the next night we stayed here gathering till even later because we are ready and expectant. And so when you show up to church, don't just show up thinking, oh, I'm gonna sing a couple words, a couple lyrics. I'm gonna, sometimes I'm just get my ears start bleeding because it's so loud in here, like whatever. Like, no, you show up hungry, you show up ready, you show up expectant. They were ready for what was about to happen. And so what was about to happen? <laughs> well, this is what's about to happen. Paul's preaching. And it says in verse nine, a young man named Eutychus, which actually means fortunate, was sitting at a window and he sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Yo, this is in the Bible. Paul preached a dude and he fell out the window. Paul's just preaching and preaching and preaching. And some people will see this and be like, well, that's why you guys gotta preach shorter sermons. No, 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 they were hungry, they were ready. And you wanna know why they didn't care how long the sermon was? Because no one even noticed this boy falling asleep and falling out the window. They were so glued in, so tuned in to what was happening. They would have been, there would have been someone sitting shoulder to shoulder with this boy. They would have started to notice if they were paying attention, this boy just falling asleep. He would have likely been one of the servants there. So he was working all day and then he's working all night throughout church as well. He is tired, he is worn out, but yet no one notices. Why? Because they are so glued in to what was happening because they knew that every single time that the church gathered, a miracle could happen. Breakthrough could happen. Something incredible was going to happen. And so Paul's preaching, Eutychus falls asleep and he falls three stories down onto the ground and dies. Dr. Luke pronounces him dead right there on the scene. But then Paul, verse 10, went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, do not be alarmed for, I can just imagine it, he just breathed, for life is in him. And when Paul, so he just brings him back to life, okay? But then Luke just quickly moves on, he says, and when Paul had gone up and had broken bread, so he then leads them through communion. Hey, I just raised this kid to life. Let's go take communion, y'all. And when he had eaten, he conversed with them a little, a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive. Yo, how crazy is this? And how beautiful is it that Luke would put this in the Bible, that God would put this in the Bible as a picture for you and me of what can happen when the people of God gather and that every single night, a miracle could be on the move. A miracle could be in the works. 
Third application point for you right here is to keep Jesus at the center. If you find yourself at a church that doesn't keep Jesus at the center, you need to find yourself a new church. Notice what Paul does right there. He raises this kid back to life and he says, let's go take communion. He points them immediately back to Jesus. He was like, I don't want y'all harping on what I just did. It's not about me, it's about Jesus. He directs them immediately, their attention back to Jesus. And he starts to preach some more and he preaches some more and the church begins to change. And notice what he does next. He gets on a boat and he leaves. See, Paul could have easily stayed and hung out with them. Imagine the next day. Imagine the revival that likely broke out there. It could have been so easy for Paul just to be like, hey, I'm gonna hang out here at this church a little bit longer. But no, he said, I've gotta be on mission. I'm on mission, we're on mission. He grabs his crew, they get on a boat and they go to the next city to share the gospel. Fourth point, don't forget to scatter. See, the church is about disciples coming together and disciples are disciple makers and they multiply. They have a mission to go and spread this message as far as possible. They got on the boat and left. And as I've been reading this story and why I just felt like we had to talk about this story tonight is I feel like the Lord was like just burning in my heart that what if I was a part of this church, but what if I skipped out on church that night? What if I just didn't really feel like going to church? What if I was just tired and worn out from the day and I had a bad day and I got stuck on 285 in traffic and, and, and it just, I got a call from the school and my son or my daughter was sick and just, I just didn't really think that I could make it work and so I just stayed home and I just missed church that night. What if that was you the next day, you go to meet up with your friends and you're like, how was church last night? And they're like, bro, let me tell you what happened. We met all night, and in the middle of that, some kid died, Paul raised him back to life, which is a big deal, by the way. I feel like we've kind of downplayed that a little bit. Paul raised this kid back to life. We take communion, we keep on meeting throughout the entire night until the sun comes up. You missed it. Like talk about FOMO. What if you skipped church that night? What if I missed the miracle? I'm asking myself that question. You should ask yourself that question every single Sunday night when the question or thought comes into your mind, ah, do I gotta go tonight? What if I miss out on the miraculous? Which leads to point number seven of why you gotta awaken to the gathering and stop sleeping on the church is because what if you missed the miraculous? What if God shows up, the Holy Spirit moves, and you miss out on a miracle that God wants to unleash upon his church, to set his church on fire, to go out and reach a lost and dying world? What if you missed a miracle? Because every single time we gather, breakthrough is on the way. I wanna close with this last story. In 1904, revival broke out in Wales, the country of Wales. This movement was led by a young man named Evan Roberts. Evan grew up in a coal mining community and he quit school to become a coal miner at the age of 12. But at 13, Evan Roberts gave his life to Jesus and everything changed. Shortly after his conversion, he heard a sermon in which the preacher spoke about the glorious outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he asked this question to the congregation. He said, what if the Spirit should come in one of our services and you were not present? What if the Spirit should come in one of our services and you were not present? Evan heard this and he became so determined to never miss a church gathering that all the way through his teens and into college, he would attend every gathering that the church offered. He was at the church six out of seven days of the week. At age 25, Evan was called to ministry after a supernatural night of prayer following one of his church's gatherings. Following that night, he felt a deep conviction to preach and when given his first opportunity by his pastor, he preached to a group of 16 young people one Sunday night. Roberts wasted no time getting to the point. He spoke about the fullness of the Holy Spirit that was available for Christians, but declared that they must first fulfill four conditions. He said, confess all known sin to God, 
Put away all doubtful habits. Obey the Holy Spirit promptly and confess Christ publicly. His teaching was accompanied with this deep sense of Holy Spirit conviction. And by the end of the night, all 16 young people give their lives to Jesus. That night was so powerful that the very next night he was asked to come back and then the next night and then the next night and then the next night until revival started to break out in their little town of Lauer. Word spread to the surrounding towns and churches and prayer meetings started to fill up. Churches that were typically half full were now overflowing and services would start at six and go through midnight. One pastor recalled saying that often he was asked about their service times and people assumed that it was 6 p.m. to to midnight, but he would have to correct them and say, no, 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 we meet at 6 a.m. and we meet all the way through midnight every single day. But what broke out didn't just stay within the walls of the church. The entire country of Wales was a changed nation within a couple months. Crime was reduced to almost nothing. Their courts would typically have 700 cases a week, but during and after the revival, the courts had two cases a week. The police had no work to do. And so they started to attend church gatherings and many of them were saved and then ended up joining the praise teams and forming little singing groups within the churches. Taverns where people used to go to get drunk were now empty and revival flowed through the cities and towns. In one year's time, by conservative estimates, around 150,000 people were born again in Jesus. The revival went on to sweep through Europe and Canada and America and many other parts of the world. And many would look back and credit all of this to this incredible work by Evan Roberts and a move of the Holy Spirit. And absolutely, the Holy Spirit, absolutely, God is gonna do what he wants to do. But I wonder, when thinking about this story, Would Evan Roberts have been postured to lead that movement if it weren't first for his commitment to not forsake the gathering of the people of God? I believe that those words spoken by his preacher at a young age echoed in his mind throughout his entire life. What if the spirit should come in one of our services and you were not present? Eleve City, you gotta be in the room. Because what if you missed the miraculous? Let's pray. God, I'm just in awe. God, of this reality that we get to gather together in your presence with your people imperfect people that have been bought by your precious blood when you died on the cross to make a way for us to be called sons and daughters of the God of the universe. God, I'm just blown away that you would love me. God, I'm just blown away by your grace that you would save us, that you would freely offer us grace upon grace upon grace that no matter our past mistakes or our current shortfalls or our future failures, you say, I wanna love you and I wanna invite you to come and be with me. God, I'm so grateful for what you've done for us and for the gift of eternal life that's offered through your one and only son, Jesus, through a relationship with your one and only son, Jesus. And God, I'm so grateful that you didn't leave us on on our own, but you said, I'm gonna be with you and I'm gonna surround you with my people so that you can be a part of my mission and redeeming the world. And so Jesus, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for what it cost you. Thank you for what you have done so that we could be a part of your church, your bride. God, you are so good. God, I just pray that tonight that you would stir in each of us a greater sense of just gratitude and belief in what you're doing in your church. And God, I pray that that question would just burn in our souls, that what if the spirit would show up tonight and I miss out on the miraculous.